Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to BigfootEyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Tori. Tori, welcome to the show. Hi, Vic. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming on. We appreciate your time. Tori, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay, I'm uh, 60 years old. I am living with um, my daughter, her boyfriend, three grandchildren, and my boyfriend in Ohio. And um, semi-retired. I'm mostly the chief cook and bottle washer around here. But um, previously, I had been a supervisor at a bank. I had worked in counseling. And also as a paralegal for quite some time. And um, I moved back to Ohio. I'd lived in Florida for many years. Moved back to Ohio about three years ago. And uh, enjoying time with my family. Nothing wrong with that at all. Sounds like you have a great life. You say you used to be an avid outdoors person, Tori. After having your first dogman encounter, did your interest in the outdoors wane? Definitely. It was very hard for me to go outside, and especially in the forest. I used to love to go out in the forest and go hiking and camping. I used to go camping every week and horseback riding every week and hiking. And I just really didn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, there was a, a great deal of fear. That if I saw one, there's probably more. I don't know where they are. I don't know how widespread their populations are. And um, I was just afraid, especially because, well, for me, it happened in the dark. So I was especially afraid of being near a tree line or anything like that in the dark. Well, after that experience you had, yeah, that's totally expected. Touching on the whole fear topic, you also used to describe yourself as being fearless. How much of a part does fear play in your life now? Uh, well, I still have a bit of a problem when especially I have to walk to the car in, at night. Um, I just think that I'm exceptionally aware of everything around me. I'm always looking. If there's a shadow, could there be something in the shadow? So I'm always looking for that every time I have to get in or out of the car in the dark, or if I have to go out in the yard in the dark for some reason. I'm not as afraid now as I used to be, because, I mean, it's been over 20 years. But I still don't feel very comfortable. I've tried to go hiking a few times this past year, and it just... It was uncomfortable for me, very uncomfortable. It really is a shame that hiking for you, being in the outdoors for you, is never going to be the same. But I really do hope at some point you can get to the place where you can go out and really enjoy yourself still. I guess time will tell on that, but I hope that does come to be. I hope so, too. I, I really do miss those times when I could just relax outside. I think that's part of it. You know, I used to find being outdoors a very relaxing, nice experience. And now when I'm outside, I'm more like looking around. And it might not necessarily always be for a dog, man, but I'm looking like there could be something there. Well, like we talked about in our first conversation, spending as much time in the outdoors as you have your whole life, I'm sure that on more occasions than you could shake a stick at, Dogmen and Sasquatch were watching you at who knows how many given times, and they never did let their presence be known. They could have harmed you, but they didn't do that. And 
I think that says a lot yeah, about their true intention. So, yeah, please don't lose sight of that fact. Yeah, I mean, I was 37 years old when this event took place. And, of course, up until that time, I had no problems with Dogman or anything else. Oh, sure. Yeah, I just wish it would have stayed that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice. Recently, you and your daughter went for a hike, but it didn't go very well. Please tell us the story behind that. Um, well, where we live, we're actually pretty close to a very populated area. And the park that we went to was not very far from the freeway. And there were a lot of cars. And um, I was really surprised. I went out with her. We were walking around. We were like in the middle of a, a field. My daughter likes to go and hunt for mushrooms and things like that and see what kind of plants and wildlife is out there. And we had walked around a little bit and I just felt so uncomfortable. I I had that same feeling of dread and fear come back to me. And I actually felt physically sick. And it made me think that there was a dog man near really close by. Because it was the same exact kind of feeling I had when I had my encounter with the dog man. Because the, the creature did something that made me sick. It, it was like sort of like a vibration in my stomach. And I was dizzy and faint and sick. And I just needed to go. And I didn't want to go. I wanted to be able to stay there and enjoy the day with my daughter and my granddaughter. But I just couldn't. We had to leave. And that was, I don't know, maybe about eight months ago that happened. Yeah, not that long ago then. Yeah, there's nothing like feeling that bad to put a dampener on having fun out there in the woods. It's really a shame that you had that experience. What it was, all we can do is guess. Maybe it was a Sasquatch that zapped you with infrasound or something like that. I don't know what it was. I mean, we'd been walking around in the park and I felt okay at first and then it kind of hit me suddenly and we were kind of in the middle of an open field surrounded by trees like in the middle of a circle almost and so i mean if there was a sasquatch or a dog man or other creature it could have very easily been there was like kind of a gully on one side of us that kind of dipped down also it could have been anywhere around there watching us. But I definitely had that sensation of being watched and feeling that sickening feeling. Yeah, that's not good. That's a feeling that a lot of eyewitnesses report. All right, Tori, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. Thanks. Ben. The encounter happened in 1997. Uh, I was living in Ohio with my family, my husband and daughter, and we had decided that for my husband's birthday, he wanted to take a little motorcycle trip in July. And so he was going to take a trip on his motorcycle, and I was going to start a new tradition, taking my daughter on a summer trip, just her and I together, a mother-daughter vacation. Uh, my mother used to do that with me every year. We'd take a week or so and just go somewhere together. And I wanted to do that with her also. So I had rented a beach house in North Carolina in the Outer Banks, which are the islands that you know run along the coast there. And um, it was a pretty big beach house. So I thought, you know, we could really enjoy ourselves there. It was uh, situated right in between the ocean and the sound on the other side, on the west side. So we had a lot of opportunities for some, you know, nice beach time and fishing and whatever we wanted to do there. And I had decided that on our way to North Carolina, we would stop in Tennessee to visit with my mother-in-law 
she was living there um, in the mountains. And I thought it would be nice. We hadn't seen her for a while. She'd get a chance to see her grandchild. And uh, we would just stay overnight and spend a little bit of time with her and then leave in the morning to drive eastbound to North Carolina. So um, on the morning of our trip, we, we left Ohio. Headed well, we started head south, and we went to Columbus and stopped there for a while. In Columbus, we uh, had breakfast and decided to have uh, mother-daughter manicures because she'd never had one before. Um, so we did that, and then we continued on, and we got to Tennessee, and we uh, stayed over with my mother-in-law overnight. And in the morning, we had some breakfast, and we were getting ready to pack it up and leave. And I kind of felt bad because my mother-in-law made a comment to me, and I'm sure, you know, she thought it was nothing, but it sort of bothered me um, talking about, like, how silly it was for us to have this mother-daughter thing and to get our nails done and the things we were doing, she was sort of mocking us. And at the time, my daughter was only seven years old and she didn't quite understand. She was kind of like, almost like asking me, is it wrong? You know, that we did this with, with the problem. And I didn't really have an answer for her. So I was just glad we were leaving and um, heading on our way. So we did that. Got the car. I had a little tiny rental car with Dodge Neon. And um, we started to drive eastbound. And this was really before GPS. So uh, when we got on, I think it was Route 40, Interstate 40, we started heading out of Tennessee and very shortly found ourselves in the middle of a whole bunch of construction work on the road. They had decided that very morning to set up all the barrels and the construction crews out on I-40, and they were going to tear up the whole thing. And we were pretty much stuck in a traffic jam for a half an hour at least. Finally, when we inched our way up to one of the guys and the crew, I asked him, you know, how far does this construction go? And he's like, oh, we're doing the whole thing. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me, you know. So. I figured it would take much too long if we stayed on the I-40 and we dipped down to, I think it was I-70 or it was a smaller road. It was not as a bigger road. And we we're driving along eastbound going that way. And um, it's just becoming very slow go. It, it was okay at first. It was a straight stretch at first. And then as we're trying to go through the mountains, um, if anyone's driven through there, you know, it, it could be a very tight curves, very slow going. We had 15 miles an hour driving for hours and hours through these mountains. And um, eventually we came to a stretch that was a little bit straighter. And it was in North Carolina at that point. And we came through a part of the state where um, there was a lot of poverty and it was hard to look at. I remember there was a school bus where a family was living um, on the side of the road and it had one tire on the school bus, broken windows and little kids were living in there with their family and they're like looking out the windows. And I was like thinking how terrible it was because it was hot and full of mosquitoes. And I just, I felt terrible for these children. And I was actually starting to cry because there was miles of, I don't know if we were like in some kind of school bus dumping ground or something. I'm not sure. But, um, and I'm not even sure if we were still on uh, Route 70 at that point. We might have been on a different road. But there was a lot of poverty and sadness. And um, I was troubled by it. And I'm thinking to myself, so far, this vacation's not working out so good. 
So uh, we head on further and I realize we need to get fuel and use the restrooms. So we find the one and only gas station there and uh, go to fuel up and go inside. And um, it was a horrible, horrible little place. We went in and when you walk in the door, the counter is directly there to your left. I mean, there's not even room to move your arm barely to get in the door. And then right straight ahead was the bathroom and my daughter needed to use it pretty badly. And we go in there and it was so close to the counter that the clerk could lean over the counter and open the door if he wanted to, which I found privacy issue, very disturbing, very creepy, but we didn't have a choice. We're in. So my daughter and I go in and the bathroom is absolutely filthy it had never been clean i'm sure of that never ever ever and she's starting to cry now because this is really bad and she needs to go so you know we took care of that and got out of there as quickly as possible i had hoped to um, stop and get you know snacks and drinks and whatever but no we we're just going so we got out of there and left and we continued on our windy roads uh, further east, and it's getting very, very, very late because I had been thinking I would be going at least 55, 60 miles an hour across the state, and I've only been going 15 miles an hour, and it's pretty late. It's around dinner time, and we decide to stop at a little restaurant that we found to have something to eat and get out of the car, stretch. So we go to do that. And we go into this restaurant and it's completely empty. We're the only people in there. Um, it was a nice, clean place, thankfully. Um, but it wasn't comfortable at all. They had like really hard wooden chairs. Everything was wood. Wood floor, wood walls. Everything was hard and uncomfortable. And it took a long time for our dinner to come. It took like an hour for them to make the dinner and serve it to us. So, you know, by the time that happened, I was like, wow, I'd really like to get things moving along. Um, now, I had to arrange to pick up keys for the rental house that we were having. And um, I knew we were going to be late getting there to the coast. So I called the real estate agent and told her, you know, we're going to be pretty late coming in. You know, will I still be able to get these keys or can we make an arrangement? And she said she'd leave the keys in the real estate office in a lockbox for me. And I was like, great, that's fine. That way it doesn't matter what time I get there. I can just go in the office, get the keys and go to the house. So we started to uh, drive and it's getting pretty late. By the time we got to um, close to the coast, it was probably 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night. And I was surprised because we're coming in through by Roanoke Island. I thought and I knew that along the Outer Banks, it's a very, very popular vacation spot. So in the summertime, there's many, many, many people that go there and uh, take rental places. And I'm not seeing anything. I'm not seeing lights. From where I am, I can sort of look downward toward the coast. So I can look down onto the Outer Banks. I don't see any lights. I don't see any buildings. I see absolutely nothing. I don't see a light for a house or a street light, or a hospital, or a gas station, or a convenience store. I don't see anything anywhere. And I'm getting worried. But the street signs tell me that I'm coming in the right way. So I just keep going. And we get to a causeway that goes across um, to the Outer Bank Islands. And when I get to this causeway, I start to become really fearful 
because it's very long, very straight, very dark, and there is absolutely nobody around. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking this is like an episode of the Twilight Zone where everybody on Earth dies and there's one person left and they don't know what to do. And I kind of had that feeling like everyone was gone, like there was nothing left. And I was afraid because, you know, um, I'm just this little tiny woman. I got my little kid. She's only seven. And she's asleep in the back seat of the car. And I think to myself, if the car breaks down on this causeway, we're going to be stuck here forever. I don't know how long it'll be before another car comes along because there's just nobody. And I thought, well, I can't just sit here thinking about it all night. So I headed across the causeway and um, we came onto the islands. And I'm not exactly sure where the real estate office is. I have an address for it, of course. And there's just really one main road that, you know, goes up and down the coast on those islands. And it's a very narrow island, too. So I don't know. It's just very dark. And I was surprised to find that um, that little street kind of was winding and there were more sand dunes. I expected it to be flatter and I expected there to be people, but I wasn't getting any of that. So I had a lot of hills and grass and brush all around me, pitch black out there. And we're driving along and I can't seem to find the real estate office. So after driving for about, I, I guess about 10 miles, I decide, I think I must have missed it. So I turned around and started heading southbound again to retrace my steps and see if I can find this office. And I drive around, I'm driving and driving, and I can't find it. And I thought, okay, well, I must not have gotten to it then. So I turn around, head north, and I go again for several miles. And I come around a curve and I have to slam on my brakes because there is a cow sleeping in the middle of the road. And I don't know what to do about it. It's directly in the middle of the road. I can hardly get around it. So this cow was in the middle of the road and I had to kind of go off the berm a little bit to get around this cow. and. It really startled me. I did not think that there were cattle there. I didn't think there were farms. I really expected to just be residential vacation area. And that's not what I was seeing. <laughs> so um got around the cow and kept driving north. Drove for quite a while and did not see the real estate office. So once again, I turned around, headed south, retraced our steps and was looking all over and I could not find any. So I turned around again and it's getting really late now. I'm actually angry at myself for taking so long and I just want to get there, but no such luck. So I turn around, go north and I'm driving and I start to come around uh, a curve and there's sort of like a little dip and a little hill um, to the left of me, the left of the driver's side, and some really tall grass. I mean, this grass is maybe five, six feet tall. And as I'm coming around the corner, I see someone come out of this tall grass that's like right next to me in front of the car. And my mind kept identifying and re-identifying this quote unquote person. When he first came out, I saw a silhouette and I thought it was an African American man for a moment. I thought I saw uh, a goatee, a chin hair, and really thick, like dreadlocks uh, on the back of the man's head. And then as I, I continue to get all of the image in my eyes, <laughs> I see the waistline 
on this guy and it's so skinny that I can't believe it. And I, I'm, I'm going up and down eyeballing it. And I realize, oh, no, this is not a human being. What is this thing? And then I look at the shoulders and I'm like, oh, my gosh, the shoulders are like four feet across. How is this possible that the thing can even exist? I mean, what is this? And it was it looked like it had very short black fur all over it, like really short, like fur like a panther, maybe like a black panther. Um but on the back of the neck, it was very, very thick, like a lion's mane or something, very thick. And it was so muscular. It looked from the shoulders down to the knees like a human being. But the head looked like a canine. And it had red eyes bright bright red eyes and i've heard people say um they've seen dogmen with like yellow eyes or amber eyes this thing had red red eyes and for when i looked at those eyes he's looking right at me and they're almost i'm thinking to myself they sort of look like they glow they and I, it was like if it was like i shine from my headlights wouldn't that make it like shine like kind of like whitish you know like a cat or a dog but it looked red like glowing red and it was so evil looking i really for a moment thought i was looking at the devil himself in my mind i said this is the devil himself and then he was so casual and he kind of turned his head and looked across the road and and then I thought, no, it's one of his demons, though, for sure. And then I looked down at the feet, and this thing is, like, right in front of my car, like, right in front of me. It's less than 10 feet away from me. And I look at these feet, and I think they were, if you measured them, probably two and a half feet long for these feet. They were really long. And he had the the backwards kind of thing. You know, once he got to the knees, it was like the heel of his foot almost looked like a knee going back because it was so, the foot was so long. And he definitely had hands. He didn't have paws. They were hands with very long, dark claws. And um, he was very, very, very black fur. And you could see through the fur to the skin. And and that's what made him look like a man. Because you could see the, mus- the muscles on his chest and everything looked like a man. Um, it was really, really terrifying. Because I, and I'm realizing this thing is so tall. He's like eight feet tall. Probably weighs 400 pounds. This thing is gigantic. And then he turns and he looks back at me. And he smiles at me. And I think, okay, that's it. I've I've gone nuts. I've lost my mind for sure. I mean, who has a werewolf standing in front of their car smiling at them, right? Nobody. So I was pretty freaked out at that point. And then my daughter, right when this is happening, she starts to wake up. And she's like, Mom, are, are we there? And I'm like, no, go back to sleep. I'll tell you when we get there. Okay, so she goes back to sleep, and I'm thinking, if this creature knows I have a little kid in the car, it's going to make me easy prey for him. And I don't want him to know I have a child in the car. But at that point, I realized my moonroof was open, so he probably heard her. He probably could reach right in and pluck either one of us out of the car if he wanted to. Or take the whole car. And I thought he could toss this car. And then. He turns. And um, he decides. He's leaving. So I guess he had enough of me. I wasn't very exciting. And he starts to go across the road. And it just takes like two steps. And he's across the road. And it was almost. um, A stride sort of. like a Almost like a kangaroo. I mean he could really just. 
lift off with those long feet, just sort of bounce off the road. And that's when I thought, oh my gosh, what if there's more? What if they're all around the side of the roads? And I thought to myself, I've been going back and forth on this stretch of road. I've probably interrupted some kind of hunting this thing is doing. And I might have gotten it mad. And I want to get out of there. So I floor it. I don't know how fast I was going, but I'm just like, I don't care. I'm getting far away from this thing. And so I floor it. And I'd say about, I think, between eight and 10 miles away from there, I finally found the real estate office. And um, it was set back from the road. It was a little cottage. And so I had to drive deep through these tall trees to get to this little real estate office. And my kid is starting to wake up again. And she's thinking we're there. And I'm like, no, honey, I just, I got to get the keys. And I'm terrified now because I have to get out of the car. And I know these things are out there. And what if they followed me? You know, maybe they probably couldn't logically, but they could have. I realized how fast that thing was fast. So I know if it really got a scent, it probably could have followed. So I jump out of the car, lock the door, run into the real estate office, get my keys, run back to my car, unlock it and get in and drive out of there as fast as I can. And uh, we were at that point pretty close to the rental house. And uh, I think it took about five minutes to get there from there. So once I got to the rental house, I realized it's pitch black. It's so total darkness. And it was a very big 10 bedroom house up on stilts. And at one point I had thought of inviting some people to come with us and changed my mind. So that's why we had this big house for nothing. So um, my daughter's starting to wake up and I'm realizing, okay, somebody's got to go find the lights to this house because the lights were on. And, you know, they had expected me to show up in the daytime. Otherwise they probably would have left the light on for me. But so I have to go underneath the house to find the light. It was so scary to go in pitch darkness under this house that I'm unfamiliar with. I'm not even sure where the lights are. I'm searching in the dark for light. Finally got the light on and we just grabbed like just a few small number of things to just get in the house really quickly. And by the time we got to the beach house, it was like four o'clock in the morning. So this means for four, at least four, four and a half hours, I was driving around trying to find this real estate office. That's a lot of time <laughs> to go by. And um, it was pretty scary. Um, the next day in the daylight, we had, um, I didn't want to tell my daughter anything about it because I don't want to scar her or scare her to death for the rest of her life. But the next day we had, um, bicycles at the house that were part of the rental and we decided to take a little ride to the beach we were riding around and i'm going through sand dunes with her and i'm just looking everywhere thinking one of these things is going to pop out and get me i was scared through the whole trip and at night um you know i'm sure there were lots of restaurants and things to do but i didn't want to do that i went to the grocery store got some food and prepared it at the house because I just, I didn't want to be out there in the dark. And so that affected me for quite a while where I, you know, was just really looking over my shoulder all the time, especially when I'm heading to my car or away from my car. And, um, you know, I just tried to just deal with life. And I thought, well, this happened in North Carolina and I was living in Ohio. So I was putting a lot of miles between me and this dog man or dog man pack, I thought, you know. And I didn't think about it very much. I tried not to think about it. I think I told my husband about it and he was like, okay. 
And, you know, a few people that I did try to tell about it, they you know, didn't necessarily disbelieve me, but they didn't believe me. And when my daughter became an adult, when she was older, I did tell her about it and she doesn't believe in it at all. And I, I found that kind of ironic considering she was in the car and I was like desperately trying to protect her, you know, during this event. And so fast forward, you know, many years later, I was back in Ohio again and, um, I really didn't say anything to my daughter or my granddaughter about this, but one day I was driving my granddaughter to school and this was just last year in Ohio. And um, the area where her school is, is it's close to the lake and also close to the train that goes through near there. And on this one particular morning, I was dropping her off and there's of course the usual morning hustle and bustle there, you know, all kinds of people dropping off their children and moving around a lot of movement, people walking their dogs, uh, people walking their children to school. If they live nearby, a lot of that going on and I'm heading westbound on the street by her school. And all of a sudden I see a whole bunch of deer. All the and they were all female, they were all does. I saw a whole bunch of them, and they are in a panic and they're running down the street and they're running on the sidewalks and in the front yards and going into the driveways and in the backyard, trying, it seems to me, to go toward the train. I don't know why, but I guess there's a little bit of a uh, wooded area that is surrounding the train track in certain places, but. Where we were located, there was like a 10 foot, 12 foot chain link fence that would block anyone from the train coming away from it or going toward it. You just, it was a barrier. But further west in the direction I was going, there was a, a little street that would uh, break through that and cut across over the railroad tracks, which is where I needed to go to go home. And I started to wonder what's going on, why all these deer are running toward all these people. I mean, that would not be their normal way of acting. They would try to shy away from human beings. But these deer were running right at the cars and the people and everything. And I was freaking out a little bit. And I drive further on what they were running away from. I guess. And I, I make a turn going north and I start to go over the railroad track and I go very slowly because I'm wondering if something's wrong. And I look to my right and for just a split moment, I could have sworn I saw a dog man there behind a telephone pole. And then there was a lot of brush around there, too. But I had to keep going. I couldn't just stop on the railroad track and stay there all day. I had to keep going. But I thought I saw his face. And um, it was uh, uh, almost like the coloring of a, a Doberman or a Rottweiler. It had like the brown and the black mix kind of look on the face. I didn't see the body. I just saw the face. And I got out of there and I, whatever it was, it, it was staying there. <laughs> and it didn't seem like it was going to cross those tracks. But... For a split second, I thought to myself, what if this dog man comes out in front of all these kids? I mean, can you imagine how devastating that would be? It would be terrifying, terrifying, a whole school full of kids. I was very upset about it. Um, and I went home because, thankfully, my granddaughter was already inside in the school. She would go in and have a little bit of breakfast before her classes and stuff. So she was in, and I knew she was safe. And um, I, I just didn't think it, that this dog man thing would come out in front of everyone. Anyway, it seemed like it was shying away from 
me when I came across the tracks. So I don't think it would be coming out there and making itself known. But after leaving, I kind of had a little bit of a guilt trip thinking, why did I leave? I should have stayed there. I should have. I don't know. I don't know what I could have done, but I felt a little bit guilty that I left. I didn't feel good about it. And that's really about it for my dog man encounters. I wish you wouldn't have felt any guilt. I mean, after all, you were placed in a very difficult situation and you just handled it the best way you knew how. So I think you did very well. Well, you know, I mean, it was a very unusual predicament to be in. I mean, what am I going to say? Hey, everybody, get out of here. There's a werewolf. <laughs> and what am I going to say to these people anyway? There's not really anything I could do. You're right. Yeah, there really wasn't anything you could have done. Do you see there being any possibility that your encounter was accidental that night? Well, like I said, I think looking back on it, that I interrupted something. I think my headlights going back and forth on that dark, dark road caught its attention and maybe interrupted whatever activities it had going on, whether it was hunting or something else. And I think it was showing itself to me with great delight <laughs> to kind of say, look, I'm here. You know, maybe you want to go away now. <laughs> I mean, because it definitely was enjoying it, putting the fear into me. And I don't feel like it wanted me around. And, you know, if it was after some deer or the cattle or whatever was over there, which I started to wonder about the cow that I saw in the road, whether it was alive or dead. I don't know because I wasn't examining it. I just wanted to get away from it. That might have been its prey at that moment, and I might have gotten in the way. That might be what happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't taunting. It just saw you as a source of entertainment, and it decided to take advantage of that opportunity. You know, I, I think that's definitely part of it. And I was trying to stay really super, super calm because of my daughter being in the car. I didn't want to, you know, like start crying or screaming or anything. Because I didn't want her to hear it. I didn't want her to wake up and then see it. So I was being really calm. And I think that bothered the dog man. I think he's like, wow, you're really boring. You know, this isn't fun at all. You know, because I think he was really trying to elicit a big, big fear response out of me. And I felt it inside of me, but I didn't demonstrate it. I mean, I didn't cry. I didn't wet my pants. I didn't scream. I didn't do any of the normal things people would do when they're really terrified, even though I was really terrified. All I know is I felt sick. The thing made me feel sick. And that's what I was talking about earlier. When I was in the car, it this like wave came over me that I've never felt before or since, <laughs> except for that time at the park. And it, it, it felt like a rumbling inside my body, like, like a vibration. And I felt really like I'm going to be sick. And I didn't get sick. I sure thought I was going to for a minute. Oh, I bet you did. When it stepped in front of your car that night, was there any way you could have driven around it? Mm, no. Because, well, when he stopped, I didn't know if he was going to stay stopped. So if I would have veered around him to the right, he might have cut me off. You know, because he might, it looked like he was going that direction. I was actually surprised when he turned and looked right at me and then smiled at me. I was, I was pretty much paralyzed at that point. I was like, uh, -uh no. I was having a lot of trouble wrapping my mind around what I was looking at. Oh, I'm sure it's a lot to process. At any time after you had that encounter, did you ever think it was a werewolf that you saw? 
you know, I thought that it looked like a werewolf, but I never thought it was a werewolf. To me, um, I think like people turning into werewolves just seems ridiculous. But I think it's an actual animal. It's a very, very intelligent animal. And I think it's some kind of a hybrid between a human being and some kind of canine. But I don't know if that hybridization happened, probably happened thousands and thousands of years ago. And um, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe human beings are hybrids taken from their DNA. I don't know. I, I I think I thought about it a lot. Like after my trip, I went home and I had a computer and I went online and I tried to look, look up information and there was nothing. Yeah. Unfortunately, there really wasn't that much info out there. Like you said, did you experience more trauma thinking about how different things would have been for your daughter if she would have seen it or from seeing the dog mean yourself? I was really worried about her seeing it. I did not want that to happen because as afraid as I was, can you imagine being a little child and seeing that? It would have been too much. She would have never been okay. I mean, I would have had to been dealing with all kinds of stuff with her. And the weird thing about it is, <laughs> this is, I didn't really talk to you about this, but she is, one of those really great nature persons. I mean, my daughter can go out there and catch fish with her hands. <laughs> she has gone out in some of the most dangerous parts of the Everglades to go camping. She doesn't have the fear. She's, they had panthers around their campsite at night. She's not afraid of this kind of stuff. Like of nature, you know, even the dangerous parts of nature. But I still think if she would have seen this, she would have never grown to be that brave outdoors person. And um, her and her boyfriend still like to go way deep in the woods camping. And uh, I worry, but she doesn't believe in it. Well, what am I going to do? Well, thank goodness she knows the dogmen aren't real. That's all I can say about that. Uh, she doesn't think they're real. She doesn't believe it at all. So, Oh, I'm sure she's convinced that's the case, but hopefully she never finds out the error in her ways. I hope she never sees it. I hope she never sees a cryptid of any kind because it's not, it's not a joyful experience. That is not how I wanted my vacation to go at all. I wanted to have a happy time with my kid. I didn't want to be fearful through my whole trip. And for the rest of my life. Yeah, no one would want that. You have what you think might be a false memory that worries you more than seeing that dog man. Please tell us more about that. Well, as I mentioned, there was a lot of time that went by. I mean, it went from like 1130, 12 o'clock midnight until 4 o'clock. It was a little bit after 4 when I got to that beach house. That's a long period of time. And I'm also having. Like it, this did not occur for the first several years. Okay. But every now and then I have like a memory of another dog man coming from the other side of the road. And I don't know if that's something that I dreamed about or if it's something that actually happened and I just lost time somehow and I, I don't really remember it. But I have like a vision of a different dog man not the black one that i saw that came on my side of the car but one coming from the other side of the road that's sort of like grayish brown like um more of a mottled or brindle kind of color and i don't know if that's real or something i made up in my head i just don't know yeah it might be a suppressed memory it's really hard to say you know because i lost so much time on that road you know maybe you know, maybe I was in such shock that there was more to it that I just blocked out. I don't know. 
I hope that didn't happen. Hopefully that is just your mind trying to cope with that experience, but it's entirely possible, so you never know. Unfortunately, a dogman isn't the only cryptid you've had an encounter with. Please expand on that for us. I know. This one is... This really got me, because this was years after the dogman experience, and completely out of the blue, I had been living in South Florida with my boyfriend and his brother. And the... Apartment we lived in, there were two apartments per building. So there was one, I guess, west of us, and we were on the east side of it. And our apartment was more like a little house. It had um, a fenced area that went all around three sides of our apartment. And we also had an enclosed patio. The enclosed patio had three doors, basically. One door went to the outside in the front yard where, you know, the main street was. We had a back door that went to our backyard that was enclosed in the fence. And then we had one that went inside to the apartment. And on this one night, my boyfriend's brother was sleeping. He had a dog that um, his dog was deaf. So if something was around, unless the dog smelled it, she wouldn't bark. So really not very much of a guard dog unless she's wide awake. And my boyfriend and I were in the next room sleeping. We were dead asleep. And we always closed the door. We didn't leave our bedroom door open. But we had two windows in the bedroom. One was uh, on the side by a walkway, which was, it was all, everything behind our bedroom was closed in by that fence. So on this particular night, It was pretty nice weather that night. We left the door from the apartment to the patio open and the back patio to the backyard open. Nobody could get into the fenced area because it made a real loud clicking lock on it. The noise was very loud if somebody came in. So we had the door open because often the dog would go and just walk out into the backyard and do her business. That'd be fine. So I'm in a dead sleep. I mean, my boyfriend, everybody, we're all really, really, really in a deep, deep sleep. And I wake up very suddenly to a creature biting my toe. And I bolt straight up out of bed. And there is this creature at the foot of my bed. and it's humanoid it's not really very big it's maybe if it was standing up but it wasn't it was like crawling on the floor if it was standing up it would have been maybe four feet tall it was not big and it was uh like very dark gray skin and little wisps of hair not hardly any hair it was very bald and its head was small almost like a baby but it was very human looking and very thin And I got angry. I mean, at this point, I've just, I've had enough weirdness in my life. And my boyfriend and his brother, both of them, had never had anything weird or paranormal or terrifying like this happen. Like, ever. And they were always telling me how they wish they could see a ghost or something, you know, because my life has been the opposite. I've had nothing but weirdness as far back as I can remember. And this was just the cherry on top. And I start screaming and cussing at this creature. And I'm like, what are you doing? Are you biting me? Get out of here. And I'm just, I scared it off. This thing, I got up. I don't know why my bedroom door was open. Obviously, it opened it. because I don't leave my door open. So he goes like crawling out like really fast. He goes taking off and he goes out the back door. He must have climbed up over that fence. And we had a river near there. And I I think that's the only place I can logically think of this thing coming from was by the river. We were very close to it. And there was an alley behind the fence that if you followed the alley, it would take you right to the river. 
So, yeah, I think that's where it came from. Um, I don't, I don't think it was really trying to eat me. I don't know what it was doing though, but I was mad. I was furious and I'm screaming and I'm at the top of my lungs and I cannot believe my boyfriend is snoring away right next to me, doesn't wake up for any of this. And I'm mad and I'm, you know, running through the house. Nobody's awake. And I'm just dealing with this nonsense all by myself. And I don't know why that thing didn't scare me, but it didn't. And the only thing I can say that it looked like, it looked like one of those things people call a rake. But all the people I've ever heard talk about those have always said they were like white or like transparent, like white. And this thing was very dark, like a dark gray, almost black. It was very creepy look, and it reminded me a little bit of that character on the Lord of the Rings that, you know, my precious <laughs> was Schmeagle or whatever I think it's called. And that, that's kind of what it looked like, a little bit real skinny like that. Um, I don't know. I didn't like it, and I was glad it left. I don't think I went back to sleep. Then. Well, I can understand why you didn't go back to sleep. Yeah, that's a really rough way to wake up. Not good. Did you suffer any wounds on your foot from it biting you? No, actually, it kind of got me on the toenail. I think I caught it like right at the beginning of its adventures. <laughs> I don't know. I, I caught it like very quickly. Because I think for a split second, I thought maybe the dog had come into my room. But it obviously was not the dog. She was closed up in the other bedroom. So, yeah, no, I didn't suffer any wounds. Well, thank goodness for that. Did you ever get a chance to see its teeth? No, I didn't really. I mean, it was in the bedroom. The only light was coming in through the window next to me, and it lit me up, but not that part of the room, not the foot of the bed. So that was still in kind of a shadow there. I mean, it was there was enough light for me to see it. But after I started screaming at it, it was just out of there. <laughs> well, thank goodness it left. It doesn't seem like it did, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Did it seem to have much in the way of intelligence? You know, um, I thought about that. And no, I don't think it did. I don't think it was very intelligent at all. It seemed very subhuman. I mean, we're not close. I mean, I think it could figure out how to like open a door, obviously, but um, no, I don't think so. I don't think it had much going on intelligently. You're probably right. It probably didn't. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Uh, yes, I think that if you're interested in having a dogman experience or any kind of cryptic experience, don't wish for it, don't hope for it, and don't look for it because it's not going to leave you with any good, fun memories. That's good advice. Well said. Tori, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Vic, for having me on. You know you're welcome. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.